uh, if they have a, like a list of rules of things that you should not do when starting a company, I think Unstoppable Domains basically did all of those things. This is Web3 Unlocked. Welcome to Web3 Unlocked. Web3 Unlocked. Matthew Gold is the CEO and co-founder of Unstoppable Domains. Before getting into the world of Web3, he founded multiple software companies. Unstoppable Domains is today a unicorn with a not-so-conventional route in crypto. Listen to Matthew's Web3 founder journey with hosts Kenzie Wang, Sachi Kamaya, and me, Diksha. Welcome, Matthew, to Web3 Unlocked. Usually, we always start with the background and, you know, of how you got into Web3. But this time, you know, we thought, let's do it a little differently. So the opening question for you is, what excites you the most about Web3? Uh, I'm very excited about people having more control over their digital lives. And, you know, that's everything from being able to have your cryptocurrency in your own wallet to uh, being able to have the data about you. That's where we spend a lot of time on solve domains, owning your digital identity, uh, being able to verify the information that you see online. So uh, that's what I'm interested in. I really think that Web3 gives us a chance to uh, add some new tools into our digital life, which is going to make the Internet a lot more uh, trustworthy and easy to use, hopefully. Right. Although crypto is cool, but hard to use. Um, and then we'll get there. Right. Uh, and just expand the number of things that we can do uh, online that we couldn't do before. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, Matt. So I actually uh, you know, looked you up a little bit. It seems like we overlapped in San Francisco um, while you were there. Uh, so it looks like you ran a, uh, a real estate analytics company before as a founder. And then you worked at Takabo. Uh, I know Takabo fairly well, a SaaS company in the Bay Area. And then you switched over uh, into Web3. So just curious, how did you, uh, you know, jumped into uh, Web3 in the first place? Well, it started as a hobby, which I think is the case with a lot of people. Uh, I was, I mean, I had a full-time job in tech when Bitcoin was starting to take off in San Francisco back in 2013 is when I started paying attention to it. I knew, I knew about it before then, but, you know, I didn't really get involved. Uh, and I spent my nights and weekend working on it. And when you're in the Bay Area, at least at the time, one of the things you always try to do is see, like, what was around the corner, right? And so, like right now, everyone's talking about chat GPT and AI and like that's the next big thing. So I guarantee you everyone sitting around San Francisco right now in their mid-20s is playing around with AI, right? And if you go back to 2013, what happened was is everyone um, who's sitting around their, in, in their mid-20s like myself uh, was working on blockchain, right, in the background back in 2013. And so it takes a few years for uh, good ideas to incubate. I think that the power of good ideas is underestimated, right? A lot of people talk about hustle culture. It's all about just operating efficiency and pushing through all of that stuff is important but if you're working on a bad idea you're wasting your time and so i think that it is very important to spend that time and really incubate an idea and most of the people i know who have started companies and been successful they've had a thing that's been bothering them for a while that they've been thinking about in the back of their head and so i was in the crypto space playing around with things running a node at my house uh building bitcoin apps on the weekend going to different coding courses on the weekends right and that just kind of evolved into, you know, I really have an interest around um, solving some of the reputation pieces that we that are problems online. And uh, I found that NFT domains and actually it was just blockchain domains before they were NFTs. Right. I thought that there was a very interesting place to try to address some of the problems that we have um, around like verifying data or just improving the UX uh, for Web3 products. Super cool. Awesome. Yeah, I was there too. I, I heard all the buzz, uh, you know, about crypto around that time frame, and also yeah, jumping myself similarly to you as well. Initially a hobby. Um, so then, uh, um, what made you start Unstoppable Domain? How was the uh, the founding story, the origins, all that goodies there? Uh, so I guess I finally got fed up with my nine to five, right? <laughs> and I basically said like, I just can't do this anymore. I really want to go out and do my own thing. And so I knew that if I didn't make that choice for myself, that I was just going to end up uh, staying where I was, right, and getting comfortable. So I actually, believe it or not, it was a, I was getting too comfortable where I was at, and I yeah. needed to have a change in my life. And so I actually no. just took the plunge. Yeah. yeah, I just took the plunge. I was like, I was like, I'm going to just quit, and then go make something. And then I really have to make something, because otherwise I won't be able to pay rent. 
right? <laughs> so like that was, and that was how I like jumped off a cliff. Now I had a really good idea of what I wanted to work on because like I said, I knew it was going to be something around blockchains. I knew it was going to be something around reputation. Um, and we tried several different things before us awful domain. So like I can list a couple of projects. We had a project called yeah. Forum. Yeah, Forum, Forum was oh, on. Yeah, yeah. Heard of Forum. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of Forum. Forum. Forum was on uh, Bitcoin, and it was just verified reviews of Bitcoin transactions. It didn't work. Uh, we had another one called Verified News, and that, that was actually pretty cool. So you could like verify Facebook posts, like if someone made a post about you, you could say if it was true or false, right? Uh, and that was using the blockchain, right? <laughs> so and like super clunky. Also, didn't work. Uh, and then uh, we started working on uh, domains, and specifically, we started working on. Uh, ENS and ENS launched at that time, and I think it was 2017. We were one yeah, of the first people thing. to register. Yeah, we were one of the first people to register domains um, on ENS. I used to be one of the largest ENS domain holders back in the day. I had like 500 or something. This is when there were less than 20,000 registrations or wow. 40,000 registrations. Yeah, and then uh, and then we decided that we wanted to launch our own naming systems because we we actually built a, a system for you to like be able to pay with a credit card and register an ENS domain, which is something that I don't even think exists now, really. Uh, and we were like, well, what else can we contribute? So we started building naming systems for Zillica, which is another blockchain. And we actually thought we were going to end up building naming services for a lot of different blockchains. Today, you can see we were right because there's Solana naming service, Tezos naming service. Uh, there's a lot of naming services out there for each of these different blockchains. In 2017, though, when we went all to the blockchains and talked to them, they're like, ah, we don't really want it. one. You know what I mean? So it was, it was, we were like a little bit too early. And so we said, well, why don't we just launch our own system? We launched dot crypto, which we still have to this day. And then we launched, you know, over time, uh, nine or 10 other blockchain extensions, which you can see, you know, we have dot NFT dot wallet. Um, we've launched them with different partners. We have like dot blockchain, which we launched with uh, blockchain.com. So it was really organic. And uh, I think, you know, when you're early, when you can look back at your pitch deck from five years ago, and then you can see the things that you had in that pitch deck, and they're just starting to happen now, right? <laughs> and that's where we were on Unstoppable Domains. Because, I mean, if you look at our pitch deck, we're like, every blockchain is going to have a naming service. And then you look around today, and you're like, oh, wow, that's actually kind of happening. Um, and then if you look at our pitch deck, we're like, everyone's going to use this for sending and receiving crypto uh, payments. And people are starting to do that. And we said people are going to tie back their social profiles. Well, now you can see people doing this in their Twitter. So um, it's really good to be early on technology. You get to be ahead of everybody else to figure things out. Um, and I think it's also uh, nice to just kind of write down where you think the market is going to go and see how right you are over time, because then you can feel like you're going in the right direction. Yeah, they say there's never a bad idea. It's just the timing of it, right? So uh, totally agree with that. Um, also, there are yeah, some. Was, yeah, there are there there are some bad ideas. So I think that this <laughs> yeah. is like if if you're gonna if you're gonna take if you're gonna take something from this podcast today out there, and you're a founder and you want to start something. Like, I actually think there are bad ideas. So, and, and like, there are some ideas you shouldn't work on. And you'll save your, um, one of the criteria I use for an idea that I kind of like is, do you think it is inevitable? And that's a question that I tell founders to ask themselves. Like, hey, if you're going to start something, is it inevitable? And if you look at our name, our name is Unstoppable, right? So we're Unstoppable Domains. So that's, you know, kind of where we got that from. Because I've, I said to myself, like, 100% chance people are going to use uh, NFT domains for sending cryptocurrency, like 100%. There's not even a 99%, like 100%. So I said to myself, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, somebody's going to do it, uh, it should be us. And that's what we worked on. So if you're picking ideas out there as a founder, I like that question, is the thing you're working on inevitable? Um, and some other good things like this, is like Uber, it was inevitable that you would order a car with a phone app. Tinder, it was inevitable that you're going to want to do dating. From your mobile phone like these things are inevitable uh and i think that those are the best startup ideas because if you spend time on them you know it's going to be worth it it's just a matter of sticking with it fine pick something that's inevitable great great advice um so since you've been a founder in both uh, web 2 and also web 3 startups what would you say are you know some of the biggest differences you know as someone who has operated in both before yeah so there's a lot more uncertainty in web 3 um, and that makes it more challenging. There is a lot more uh, engaged consumers in Web3, which makes it a lot easier, right? So it's kind of like what you want to do. So as a builder, I'm okay with uncertainty because I know that things don't work and I'm okay with rebuilding something if it doesn't work, right? So if you're very comfortable with changing things up because you're not headed in the right direction, then I think Web3 is great for you because you also get a lot of customer feedback. One of the biggest problems you have in Web2 which I personally experienced is you'll build something and then no one cares. And like, that's how your startup dies. It's like you build something, you spend a lot of time, you make the thing, you launch it. 
you have a big, you know, you're in TechCrunch. Oh my God, nobody signs up, right? Then you're screwed. In Web3, like almost anything you do with crypto, you're going to find like a couple dozen people who just want to try all crypto stuff. And they're going to be like, they're going to try your product. You'd be like, it sucks for these four reasons, or this is the one thing I like about it. So as a builder, I would say that's the positives and negatives. So the negatives for Web3, it's really uncertain. I mean, that's regulatory uncertainty. That's design uncertainty. There's all sorts of uncertainties there. Uh, the plus side, you have really engaged consumers. And the, and the consumers are incentivized in a lot of cases, which makes them more engaged. So that's the upside for Web3. Um, and then, you know, we talk about Web2. I think the biggest thing is just people don't care anymore. No one wants to have another SaaS app, right, for their productivity tool. Like, it's really hard to cut through that noise because there's so much stuff out there and it's just kind of boring, right? So um, if you work on something exciting, hey, this is another thing that you can kind of do if you're starting a company. Like, if you're going to start a company, pick something exciting. It'll make it easier to find customers. It'll make easier to find people who want to work with you on that project. It'll make it easier for you to find investors uh, and you'll stick out. It'll be easier for you to get more. And usually that starts off with like a personal pinpoint, just based on, you know, what you were saying just now, right? You're building for a smaller group of niche users. Initially, that's probably the best you're solving your own personal pinpoint. So that's probably why you also started uh, Unstoppable Domain, because you understand that problem very, very well. Um, yeah. Well, I would, I would also say that it's maybe you're solving a problem that people don't realize is a pain point yet. And so as someone in tech, maybe you can understand a problem that they don't quite see, right? And, and so like not a lot of people know that they have a problem with, uh, with their privacy online or controlling their data or their digital identity. This is a problem we have in Unsolvable Domains all the time. Like we have to like, we're an NFT domain company, but we're really trying to work on solving digital identity. So we have to pick a smaller part of the problem to solve first um, so that we can get people in the door. And then we can teach them more about how we think this is going to change the other things that they interact with. That's actually a risky way to do a startup, right? So like I would say a less risky way to choose to do a startup is to just solve an immediate problem that the person has right now, like shipping or something, right? So like something that's like really concrete and just like go after a really big problem that's well-defined and try to solve that thing. Um, that's that's a, uh, a safer way to go about uh, starting a company. In Web3, I do think that there is a little bit more leeway there to try an iterative approach, again, because the design space is so unknown. So... I would say that I wouldn't typically do this for a Web2 company. Like If I got a Web2 company, I want to know exactly the thing I'm going after, and it needs to be massive. I just go straight at that thing. I don't focus on anything else. On Web3, though, because the design space is so kind of open, I think it's okay to um, you know, take a really big problem and then take a much smaller piece of that problem and then focus in on those people and solve it for them. That's great. So on top of that, um, what do you think are some of the most important qualities of founders Enable, enable them to succeed in Web3. Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm not the best person for this question because I'm, uh, if they have a, like a list of rules of things that you should not do when starting a company, I think Unstoppable Domains basically did all of those things. So, <laughs> so, and, and so, all, all I, I mean, I don't know. There's kind of a list. Like, so first of all, when we took our funding, in SF, we then moved. All of us moved out of SF. So that's like a big no-no. Like you're supposed to be in SF if you do a startup. We got our money. We moved to Las Vegas because we wanted to have fun, right? And we want a lower cost of living, right? So like we but that's moved the right move. No, that's the right it, move. It, it was, but this is pre-pandemic, right? So there wasn't Zoom. There wasn't all this. Well, actually, we were using, I can't remember if we were using Zoom or not, but we, we were using remote. Out. Yeah, we were using remote tools super early. But like we broke all the rules. So like we left. Uh, the founders don't live in the same place with each other because we're remote. Um, I don't know. There's just a really long list. We don't have a token, right? Every crypto project you know has a token. Yeah. Like there's just this huge list of things. And a sample domains is like, no, we're not going to do that one. We're not going to do that one. We're not going to do that one either. Um, so I would say we're very atypical founders here at Unstoppable Domain. Um, you know, I would suggest that if you're going to start a company, you want to do it for, um, you want to do it for the right reason, and the right reason is different for different people. Uh, so I'm very mission focused. So I get upset with the way that things work online. Like I think the internet, you can't trust it. There's a bunch of scammers on there. Um, I would I would love to have more control of my data and my privacy when I'm online. And these things frustrate me online. And so like I kind of want to solve this problem with digital identity because I think digital identity will actually solve these problems. Like if people have digital identities online, they'll have reputation. So it'll be safer online. I'll be able to trust people. I'll be able to like buy something off of eBay, know that I'm not getting scammed. 
Um, and I'll also, uh, if I have digital identity, I'll have all my data with me as I move around. So I won't have to worry about losing my data. So this is like a personal problem I'm trying to solve. So you were kind of alluding to that earlier. So if you're trying to solve like a thing that really irks you personally, I think that's a good reason. And that's one of the ones that a lot of people point out why combinators like solve a problem for yourself, right? So all these people talk about this. I think that's a good reason. Uh, there's also people out there who are just really good at starting businesses. So they like running a business. And I've seen those people be successful too. So there are some, there are some, you know, software founders who like, they like to run companies. They like to build teams. They like to do this stuff. That's another good reason because it's like a lifestyle for you, but you can be very successful in this lifestyle if that's how you like to do it. So I've seen those two prof profiles be successful. Um, and then uh, other things for founders, make sure it's the right time in your life. This is a question that I, VCs ask this question of uh, founders all the time. Founders don't realize they're being asked this question, right? But VCs will be like, so tell me about what's going on in your life, you know? uh are you having six kids next year and and <laughs> like are you know like are you have you decided to live on an organic farm and not have internet like you know what do you do what life choices are you making right now and does that fit into building something impactful because you know if your life priorities next year are to get healthy uh and and may, you know maybe that's like number one for you then i would suggest that starting a startup is not a good idea like if you're if your number one priority is like i want to be healthy and have less stress do not start a company. So make sure that, like it's the right time in your life. Like I'm sitting here with literally 20, well, almost 30 cans of Coca-Cola sitting on my left hand side here. Like this is how I get through my day. Uh, and that is not healthy, right? So you have to figure out for yourself. So those are the, the attributes I would say for a founder, like figure out why you're doing it. Like, are you in it for the problem that you're trying to solve? Or, or are you just a person who's really good at um, building businesses? Like those are good profiles for being in here, like good operators or people who have a, a chip on their shoulder who, or something they're really upset about. Uh, and then, you know, time of life, I think is an important question. And that one is not talked about a lot because, you know, uh, it disqualifies a lot of people. And you just have to realize that if you're going to build something impactful, it has to be the number one thing in your life for that time period. Uh, and I can actually have a personal story here. So um, my wife and I, we uh, had gotten engaged to be married when I decided to start uh, this company. And I actually looked at her and I said, you know what? This is probably the last time I can put uh, 50, 60, 70 hours a week into something because, you know, we're going to want to have a family here in a couple of years. And I said, so I need to go try to do this startup right now. So you asked me earlier, like, why did I go and do it? And I said, I felt like I just needed to do it then or I wasn't going to. And in my personal life, it was like, OK, this is the time. Like, I need to go 100 percent, try to do a startup right now. Um, because you're not going to be the right time of life. If you get, it can be very difficult to do that if, you know, you have these other stressful things going on. And so that was, that was part of my decision uh, and, and, you know, going when I did. And I think that those are all important things to consider. I mean, we're all humans. We have one life on this planet. You should maximize it for yourself. Enjoy it, right? And uh, make sure that it fits for you because it could just be the wrong fit. It has nothing to do with you being the wrong person. Is that why you went to Vegas to get married? Really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. No, 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 no. Uh, so moving to Vegas was purely about extending our runway, right? Because if you look at when we got our funding, we got our, so we tried, yeah. we did our fundraise in 2017. We closed our funding around January, 2018, like officially. I think we had the doc yeah. sign. Like That's December the market crashed. The market just went straight down. And so we looked at the banks <laughs> and I was sitting here like, oh my God, like we've only got like eight months of runway. I'm like, you know what we could do is we could move into Vegas Right, we can move. We can move to Vegas, and then all of a sudden, instead of eight months of runway, we've got seventeen. And I was like, "Guys, how does Vegas sound?" And everyone was like, "We can do Vegas." So that's why we did it. We did it to make the business survive. So nothing related I to think my personal life. That's a fantastic idea, actually. Yeah, it is. It is contrarian to the typical Silicon Valley, you know, twenty miles, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, within the radius of a uh, Sand Hill Road philosophy. But I actually think a lot of great companies that succeeded uh, from that time period. I know a lot of them did this, uh, you know, the small town uh, or East Europe uh, sort of route in order to survive. So, yeah, kudos to you on making those uh, uh, executive decisions and, and, uh, and actually make it work that way. So on top of that, um, was there any like other any war stories or survival stories that you can share aside from moving to Vegas? You know, that's always very, very interesting to me personally. Yeah, well. So we had a lot of decisions, and I think this is maybe something where we do pretty good at Unsolvable Domains, is when things get really bad, is when we come up with our best ideas. And I don't, I don't suggest it as a lifestyle. Much better to plan <laughs> ahead, right? Like, no pain, much, no gain. <laughs> much, 
Well, you know, like, so some people out there are really good planners and they can think things through, right? And those people I'm always super jealous of because uh, they just, no, they just you know, don't tell you the stuff that, you know, they probably also have gone through. Um, okay. Well, hindsight maybe that, is always 2020. They certainly make it look a lot easier. But, but for basically for us, there were multiple times in the company where we're like, wow, we're going to go out of business really soon. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and so every time we would sit around and um, we would actually go out to like happy hour or something and, and we would just jam. And we'd be like, okay, and I'm I'm not actually a drinker, so I'd get my like non-alcoholics or whatever, or my mocktail, or maybe my one drink. Uh, and we'd sit down there, and we would just throw out ideas. I'd be like, guys, anything, like any crazy idea you have. And that's actually why we launched Dot uh, Crypto and Dot Zill because we were working on like making uh, it easier to register NFT domains, you know, and, and set it up, you know, for ENS like Dot ETH. And no one was buying them. Like this is like zero people. Like we, it's like <laughs> we do. I, I think we had a month. Where we did twenty dollars in sales, okay, yeah, oh, no. uh, yeah, and uh, they used a coupon, right, in order to make the purchase because we had like coupons for like twenty percent off. And I'm like, so like the only sale we had for an entire month was for twenty dollars, and the person didn't even pay full price; they used a coupon, right? And like that was a, and we we're just looking at each other like, wow, this is really not going to work as a business, you know? And I actually had one of our early team members who's actually still on the team; he quit. Uh, on a Friday, he's like, I just don't think the company is going to succeed. And so I actually, on Saturday, I went down and we had lunch together and we sat down at like a picnic table outside somewhere and we're just talking. I'm like, listen, man, like this thing's going to go out of business in six months anyway, right? So I was like, might as well ride it, ride or die to the ground, right? Like, so, so like, you know, like no one's going to feel bad about you if you don't do this. It's only one more semester of college that you're going to miss. It's not that big a deal, right? And so we talked through the whole thing and then he uh, hit me back on Sunday. He's like, okay, I'm coming back in on Monday. So like, that was a huge thing, right? So as a founder, you may have it like early employees or even other founders try to lose faith, right? And you just need to be real with those people, open up with what the outcomes could be and just say, you know, like worst case scenario, what happens? Like, we'll still be friends after this, no matter which way this goes. Uh, but like, you know, why not? Why not take another roll of the dice? So that's, that's one. We had another one uh, where we decided to launch .zill and .crypto because no one was buying .eth domain name. And we we're like, well, what if we do it for other blockchains, right? And so that's how we ended up with Zilliqa. Uh, and we built it on their system. And then, um, and then we said, you know, there's some things that we want to change on how uh, ENS works, but there was no way for us to do that. So we we're like, well, let's launch Doc Crypto, and then we can just make our own rules. Specifically, no renewal fees was like really important to us. So we did that. Um, and we just kept trying. And all those times were like something where we were stuck, right? We were stuck and we couldn't move forward unless we did something really radical. And I would actually say we're there again at Unstoppable Domains. So here we are like five years in. And if you look right now, not enough people are using Web3 products at all, right? The number of like daily active users for Web3 products for a non-financial use case is probably less than a thousand a day. I mean, you know, we have the numbers. It's pretty low. Uh, and we need this to be millions of days to be successful, millions of people per day, or, be, or even a billion, right, to be successful. And so we're sitting around right now and having conversations internally, like, what's the craziest thing we could try to do um, in order to spur engagement? Like, what's that thing? We've got several things that we're trying um, in order to show people the power of controlling their data and access to their data, uh, and we'll see if they work. And I'm actually kind of excited to see some of these things come out and see if they work. So, yeah, I would say it's a continual, like, threat of dying that inspires unstoppable domains to invent new things. Uh, not the best way to live, honestly, but uh, I think that's a lot of startups, you know, and, and one of the things that you can do as a startup is not uh, put yourself in a position where you have to make big innovation or die. And that's kind of the, you know, having a short runway or something like that, it can be really motivating. Yeah, Paul Graham said, uh, be hard to kill, right? Yeah, so for sure, that's, uh, that's yeah, that's how you guys survive. That's, Great story there. Um, you know, back then it was, it must be really, really tough because, uh, you know, some of, you know, I, I think some of the projects now, they can just go to ecosystem and, and do what you just said, right? You go to Zilliqa, now you can go to 10 different ecosystems and they have grants. Back in the day, there's nothing like that. So, yeah, if you didn't die back then, it's, you know, uh, you must, uh, you, you can, it's like, you know, if you live in New York City, you can live anywhere else, you know, I think. It's, it's much easier now, for sure. Also, you guys have this domain name. You can't quit. You chose this yeah. domain name, Unstoppable Domain. You know, you can't be stopped. If you stop, you know, <laughs> you'll be made fun of. They'll be like, Unstoppable Domain is stopped. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. It's it's off brand for us to do anything but try all the way to the end. So that was that was in retrospect, you know, I kind of set myself up. Uh, so I, maybe I learned a lesson there, but I'm good with it so far. So where do you think we are at now? Um, is are you more comfortable now in this, you know, current? You know, it feels like it's a little bit, you know, that 2019 all over again uh, to me personally. But it's not as bad. What do you think? Ah. So I have a contrary opinion. I actually think this is the worst it's been in crypto. Uh, so I actually think this is the worst uh, crypto bubble pop we have ever seen. And uh, I actually equate this to 2001. And if you look at 2001, you didn't really have action until 2006 or seven. So you actually had five year winter, right? So I don't think anyone in crypto is ready for a five year winter. But this feels like a five year winter uh, for crypto to me. And I'll tell you why. And that's because when you have new technology come out, just like the internet in the 90s, you have multiple quick investment cycles. So you had like 91, 94, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2001, pop, right? And if you look at crypto, we had the same thing, multiple quick successive investment cycles. Um, but what happens is, is once you get to a certain scale, and crypto this time actually hit like a, what, $4 trillion market valuation for all the stuff. If, I'm sure if you pile it all three trillion a pop. Yeah. And then if you count like, you know, the coin bases of the world and what, what's Binance actually worth. So, you know, you're talking three to five trillion dollars. Well, that's big. So before then, you know, the market size would cap out much smaller. It capped out. I remember when Bitcoin crossed a billion, I think I, I can't remember. Like, and I remember when it crossed a hundred billion for sure. And every time, like those are still small markets, you know, one billion, 10 billion, a hundred billion, 500 billion, one trillion is even small. So you can have a pop on those bubbles and then you can have an investment cycle come right back in and fill in that hole and keep you going. But when you get to a certain scale, you have to be useful in people's everyday life. And I think that crypto has finally hit that size. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we've got one more cycle in us, but we're getting close where people have to use you all the time. And that's what happened in 2001 is there are all those investment cycles and all those dot com companies. And then they had the dot com bust because it just wasn't useful yet. And it took another five, seven, 10 years for people to really uh, use them every day. And I think crypto is the exact same place. And you can point to problems in crypto that feel very much like problems back in, in, in 2000. Like, you know, in 2000, there wasn't enough bandwidth. Uh, well, we don't have enough transactions per second, right, in crypto. Uh, and then if you go, right, because you couldn't stream video in 2000, right? You can't stream blockchains right now, really, like, you know, uh, because there's just not enough transaction throughput. Um, user uh, interfaces were poor you know you didn't have smartphones you didn't have touch screens back in 2000 user interface in crypto is really bad right now like people are worried about losing their keys um, wallets have a long way to go to become user friendly there's all sorts of back-end plumbing that simply does not exist you know we don't have sms protocols you know, Twil twilio doesn't exist uh how do i you know how can i uh you know plug this into my app like how can i add delivery to my you know, online restaurant website or whatever, right? Like now that's super easy with DoorDash. So all these tooling and backend systems and user experiences, uh, kind of like in .com that weren't quite there yet in 2001, that took another five, 10 years to get there. We have that same problem in crypto right now. So that is my contrarian opinion. I think this is a uh, .crypto bubble, just like the .com bubble back in 2000. And that it is actually going to take longer than people currently estimate for things to recover. And, you know, we have to build our way out of it because all the problems are actual real human interaction problems with blockchains or, or with scaling or with, right? Uh, and those have to be solved. So yeah, I actually think this is going to be a longer investment cycle. And at least that's what we're preparing for over here at UD. I also agree that I feel like crypto has hit an inflection point that it needs a you know, crypto PayPal and crypto Twilio in order to reach a million users. Something simple like that hasn't been solved yet. And it needs to get there in order for it to actually uh, deliberate. Otherwise, uh, we're just, um, it's the same story uh, every, every, every time. I agree. Yeah. So um, my next question is, and you, you mentioned this previously, when you raised back in 2017, did investors ask you to, to do a token round? And like, why did you guys decide to you know, do equity and not, and not do tokens? Yeah, so, I mean, I'll give you the answer I gave them. It's like, we already have tokens. They're NFT domains, right? They're ERC721 blockchain assets. And that's what people are buying from us. And like, you know, Yuga Labs or whatever that's making NFTs, it doesn't have a, you know, I guess they did, the Bored Apes, did they do, they did ApeCoin, right? 
but they didn't have one to start. And what I'm saying is a lot of NFT projects don't need tokens to be successful because they're focused on the utility of their product and users in order to generate sales. And that was a choice that we made. You have to also understand that like the regulatory environment is super weird here in the US. And it's just not a risk I want to take. Like when I look at my family or my wife or whatever, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything that's going to put me, you know, in court with the SEC. Like it's just not worth it. So that's what we told investors. Like, hey, we, we're going to build a product. And then another thing that we said was, it's 100% possible to build a naming system without a token. And if that's the case, then we didn't really feel like there was a strong need to have one. Uh, so like, if you're going to have a token inside of your system, I felt at the time that it needed to be a requirement. And some things have a requirement for an internal token. I would say that Bitcoin is a good example. Like they needed to have some sort of internal value representation. Otherwise, miners wouldn't run the nodes and the network wouldn't take off. Right. So it was a way to bootstrap the network. Um, and but there are a lot of other things where I think the token is not really serving a purpose or uh, is potentially like hampering product development or consumer adoption. Um, and it, it is potentially harmful uh, for those protocols. So I haven't seen a great system built for tokens. Um, I've looked at a lot of them and we just haven't seen anything that we're really excited about at Unstoppable to put into our system in order to make it better. I think most of them would make it worse. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think it, it's really important for founders to be sure about whether they want to focus on accruing value to the token or equity and then stick with it like until the end. Otherwise, it just like, you know, trying to accrue value to the token or trying to accru accrue value to equity both can be, you know, really distracting. And I will say, like, I was also hopeful in 2017 that you would be able to issue equity on the blockchain by now, right? So, like, if you talked to me in 2017, I was like, yeah, we would love to issue shares of unsolvable domains on the blockchain. And we think we're going to be able to do that in the next five years. We would say that in 2017. It's been five years. You still can't do that, right? So I think that's yeah. regulatory. I think that's regulatory failure. Right. So like we actually I actually thought that at the time it was only two or three years away. Like I was I was really sure I was like, for sure, in two or three years, we'll be able to issue uh, stock tokens on the blockchain and it will be no problem. And then our customers, if they you know want to buy our domain names and they want to buy stock in the company, they could buy both. Right. And that was kind of I thought that that would happen, um, but it hasn't. And, you know, I wish it had, I guess. And it's sad that it hasn't happened. So Uncle Gensler would like that. It's not What's that? Happen. Uncle yeah, Gensler, uncle, not gonna, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I don't know why not. Like, we have a lot of investor protection rules, but I think that we maybe have too many. Uh, I think people are smarter than we give them credit for, right? So, like, you know, obviously, I don't think a 19-year-old should be YOLOing their life savings into something. And um, I think that, like, you know, getting 19-year-olds to sign college, you know, loans for $100,000, I think these are bad ideas because I don't think a 19-year-old can is that great at doing that math. But I think that people who are, you know, adults, if you're in your mid thirties and you want to throw all your money at a crypto project, cause you think it's a good idea or you want to invest in a small business, I think you should totally be allowed to do that. So, uh, but that's a difference of opinion between me and uh, what the rules are and we'll follow the rules while we got them. Also, you guys are probably very profitable cause your, your business uh, had revenue. So you're a real business. You don't really need a token for your kind of business. Well, that goes back to like I was saying earlier, we try to provide utility to users and we actually are able to have a revenue stream from that utility as opposed to um, depending on token the economics blockchain. you get there. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I'm glad we spoke about token and, you know, um, there's this whole concept of community in most Web3 startups and Web3 projects. And the main driver for communities to be so strongly involved, mostly revolves around rewards and tokens. So I think my question to you is that, how do you really define the community aspect of unstoppable domains and their motivation? And, and actually also the whole concept of community, like how relevant is it for your startup? Not a startup anymore, but for unstoppable domains. Uh, well, so I kind of talked about this earlier, that the great thing about crypto is that the customers give you feedback really loudly and really quickly. And so I mean, that has been super helpful for us, both from our customers and our partners and everyone that's trying to work on making something work with digital identity in the Web3 space. Um, unlike other crypto products, we don't have a native token. So we don't have the same situation where we need to have people out there ev evangelizing to get their friend to buy our token so that they can push the price up or anything like that. So 
we got to avoid doing all that, which I think is great because now we get to spend a lot more time focused on actually building the product. And we measure the success of our company not by how many people are talking about us on Twitter or um, how good they are pumping up the price of a token or something like that, but we measure it by like, hey, are people act actively engaging with domain names every day? Um, and so we can actually track that by usage. So that's kind of how we gear ourselves up. And I think that we will be successful because we want to be more a utility than uh, like a fashion statement. So we will be successful if we just see people using us every day. So um, like, I don't think, you know, Zoom doesn't have uh, a bunch of people out there, you know, trying to pump Zoom token or whatever, but billions of people use Zoom every year. And I think it's going to be the same thing with Unstoppable Domains. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke briefly about digital identities. So what do you think uh, Web3 adds to digital identities that Web2 doesn't? Yeah, I think the biggest thing um, is that you have access to data from other applications. So uh, let's just think about it like this. If you build a digital identity with something like a Facebook auth or a Google auth platform, uh, they may not want to allow access to that data from other apps. So like if Google doesn't want Apple to have your data or Apple doesn't want Facebook to have your data, they can build walls in. And you see this happening already between these large companies. So it's really that advantage of having a blockchain-based system enables you to uh, have an open system where anyone can interact with and build on top of. Uh, and that's guaranteed and locked in over time. Uh, and then that enables you to have true data portability between apps. So that's one big component is that that openness and that portability between apps. And the other is verifications. Uh, so if you want to move, uh, if you want to verify information about yourself um, from one app to another app, if you try to do that using Web2 protocols, then you have to exchange keys with app A, and then you have to exchange keys with app B, and then you have to enable app A to talk to app B. Uh, and so it becomes really complex. But if you use Web3 protocols where app A records its data to the blockchain, app B records its data to the blockchain, then if you go to app A, B, C, D, whatever, they can actually just look at one place, the blockchain, in order to see the correctness of that data. Um, and so we think that that's just a better system design for identity. So the big difference uh, between Web3 digital identity plays and something that would be built in Web2 is the uh, in Web3, you don't worry about uh, lock-in or portability. And then also in Web3, we think it's much, much simpler in order to verify the data between apps, which which also makes it easier to build on top. Of. Um, so you mentioned previously, you know, the problem with Web3 is that there's no users. Like if you look at the top 10 games on Polygon, I think monthly active users are is like 10,000 or so, which, you know, doesn't compare to the number of active users on Minecraft or um, any of the top it games. So it doesn't even compare to the number of people like in my neighborhood, yeah. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right, yeah. So, I mean, this is a problem that I've also been thinking about. You know, how do we bring onboard the next million of users onto Web three? Like, what do you think will be the vertical with, within Web three that could potentially onboard, you know, a non crypto user? And is there anything in spe specifically that you guys at, at Unstoppable Domains you guys are working on? Yeah. So the good news is, I think any vertical in web3 has the chance of cracking the user problem so i think that like as an industry uh we have lots of different people trying things that could work right uh so like it could be gaming it could be digital identity like we're working on it could be finance like uh, circle right or something like that so i actually think there's a lot of different ways to win um and then that's because i think the problem is what i talked about earlier it's like we're missing some of the tooling we're missing some of the the ux components uh, we're missing user education. And those are just things that like broadly need to come out of the ecosystem in order for everyone um, to be successful. Uh, I have one thing that I can point out in particular that I think is a big problem, and this is applies to everybody, is better solutions for custody, right? Uh, so people are worried about losing their keys, right? So backup and recovery, safety, right? So so there's like a there's definitely some problems around safety that can be solved for users when working with Web3 products that I think would make all Web3 products um, more readily adopted. And so you could see someone develop uh, something that works really well, that makes it really easy for users to onboard and to control their keys and all of that. And that could come from someone working on a digital game. It could come from someone working on digital identity. Um, it could come from someone working on um, you know, stable coin transfers. Like any of these different apps could potentially figure out a better system for that. So, and we're working on lots of things at Unstoppable Domains to make it easier for you to back up and recover 
uh, your uh, NFT domain, right? And so maybe that's really successful. And we're, we'll make sure we publish how we do it, right? You'll be able to see our GitHub and like, hey, hey, here's how we're thinking about key management model. Here's how we're thinking about access models. Um, another, an interesting one that I've seen recently that I'll just do a shout out to is actually delegate.cash. I don't know if you guys have seen them. They're working on like uh, better ways for custody so that you don't have to worry about losing your board ape when you connect to an app. That I think is kind of interesting. So I think it's a really good question, Sachi. And I think it is the only one that matters is how do we actually get a billion Web2 users onto Web3? Uh, and my conclusion after doing a lot of the research is it's a lot of this tooling, middleware type stuff, uh, UX, user education things that have to be worked on. Uh, and so it's kind of an all hands on deck thing for the industry. And who knows, keep your eyes open because the person who figures this out could be on any of these verticals because uh, I think it's a meta problem. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I guess, so So, what's your strategy in terms of, you know, increasing adoption of unstoppable domains? Like, are you guys looking to do more partnerships with other ecosystems like Solana or Polygon? Or what are you guys focusing on nowadays? Yeah, so you hit on one that I think was pretty big, which is we are trying to do more uh, standards and collaboration. So we have the Web3 Domain Alliance, which we just announced maybe like a month and a half ago. Where we're talking to all the other Web3 domain companies, and we're like, "Hey guys, let's you know, let's all row in the same direction here. Uh, like, how can we talk about NFT domains to consumers? What are some things that we should all agree to? Uh, maybe we can build a universal naming resolution service together, which we're working on, uh, just to make it easier for our specific industry. So, like, definitely working more together with others in the space in order to build some of that tooling that may be necessary to make the space move forward um, has been a, an area of investment for us. <laughs> and uh, then, I think the other thing that we're doing is we're hyper-focused on the day-to-day -day metrics. So uh, we are diving in every day, <laughs> I would say every day now, and we're trying to actually get even more. Like we're looking at spreadsheets. We're looking at like, how many people are clicking on this? How many people are doing this thing? How many people are doing this thing? And we're trying to incrementally add value for, for customers. So um, we're, we're being very open-minded about people might what they might want to do. We're willing to test a bunch of things and then we're monitoring it and then we're going back and improving or dropping or adding to depending on the data. So we're letting the customers lead us on what they want to do uh, with Web3 instead of trying to make a decision for them um, at this point. Got it. Um, and my last question is, last year, Unstoppable Domains closed a 65 million round at you know a 1 billion post money valuation. Tell us about the road of you know reaching that 1 billion valuation. You know, how challenging was it? What roadblocks did you run into? And what was your pitch to investors at, at that valuation? Yeah, so uh, I think that for founders out there, the most important thing is if you are having the best quarter ever or the best month ever or the best whatever ever in your company, like that is a great time to go out and secure funding. Right. And that's when you want to do it. So you want to strike when the iron is hot. So you got to have good timing, which is something that we did at Unstoppable Domains. Um, you know, we had the announcement out in July, but we had things signed in April. Right. Uh, and that's because we had that's really. Timing. Yeah, it's because it's because we had it's because we and I didn't make that decision because we were um, like I was like, oh, now it's got to be the time when we need to do this for some reason. I was like, you know what? The numbers are just looking incredible right now. So this is when you go out for funding because you never know what's around the corner. And then guess what? There's this horrible bear market literally right around the corner. I mean, there's just like a few months later, boom. And then and then a few months after that, boom, FTX blew up, right? And then a few months later, boom, the SEC gives a Wells notice to everyone in crypto, right? Like, it's crazy. Like, every time you turn around, it's just something terrible happening. So as a founder, I would say, like, take money and go out and get your fundraising uh, when your numbers are looking good not when you need it. And so like, that's just something you should do. So we, we got our timing right on that. Uh, there was a bit of luck to that, but there's also a bit of experience that went into that. And I think that's super important to get right. Um, the story when you tell investors, well, you know, TAM is you know total addressable market. It's always something you need to tell investors if you want to build a really big uh, company. And for us, I think the analogy was actually quite simple. If you look at small businesses, there's about 30 to 50 million small businesses out there who own domain names. There's about 350 million domains that are owned. And then if you look at what Unstoppable Domains is building, is we're building a naming system for individuals, not businesses. So we could say that, hey, there's actually three to five billion internet users, right? And each of them are going to need three to five names. So that means our market size is not 300 million. It's actually closer to 10 to 20 billion, right? In terms of how many names we need to issue. So we're, if you're going after a really big market, you're showing user traction, and we had traction, we actually had numbers behind it, uh, you're going to get there. 
And those are the things that you need. Um, another thing around the journey that I think is important to point out is we pivoted probably twice a year, every year since the beginning of our company. And now we didn't make major pivots, right? So like if you look at our original pitch deck, we're like, we're going to be, uh, we're going to do domains and they're going to end up being digital identity. That's been consistent. But if you look at like what parts of the product we're emphasizing or where we're trying to build features, we've moved around however we need to in order to navigate the waters at that time. And so like, you know, we were very focused on websites when we got started. And then we were very focused on crypto payments a little bit later. And then we we're very focused on um, like using it to log into places this past year because we thought that that was super important. Um, and now we're very focused on like you adding more data to yourself, right? And creating your profile. That's become a thing. Uh, so that's a lot of changes for the same company. It looks the same, but it's actually very different when you're when you're in it. So uh, um, I guess for like outside investors, they would just say, oh, yeah, all that stuff is digital identity. But living that experience, it really feels like you're making really hard shifts. And that's because you're so close to the product, right? <laughs> that, that, like you can't really tell how how these things are actually kind of the same. Um, and so I guess maybe I would say step back and be OK with uh, changing your direction in the short term to be a little more open minded about what what your product could be, like how much can your product can encompass? A lot of people don't ask themselves, how big can I go? Right. And I think that you sell yourself short when you don't do that. And that's another important part if you really want to stretch out there. And uh, if you want to be a company who who uh, has world impact. So hopefully that was helpful. Those are just a couple things I could go on for an hour. But uh, I think that that's, you know, broad strokes that that can kind of paint where we went. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, let's say you know someone want to buy a dot ape or dot azuki or dot whatever. You know how hard is it for them to recommend that domain name to you guys, um, and how fast can you guys spin out a different domain name? Yeah. So um, the cost for launching new TLDs is actually around uh, regulation and legal compliance, right? It's not actually around the technical cost. So on the tech side of things, it's very easy for us to spin out new to, um, TLDs. Uh, but on the legal and compliance side, trademark, all the tooling, that's the expensive part where you have to do it. And um, that's that's where that's where the, the cost is for those people. So when we look to launch new TLDs, we want to work with partners who are able to uh, help uh, offset those costs. Right. So we work with blockchain.com to launch blockchain. They're obviously a really big crypto wallet. So for them, dedicating resources in order to making sure that uh, extension gets adoption is, you know, it's just a line item and they can afford to do it. But how much for dot polygon? Ha, well, so uh, we, I, no comment, actually. I can't comment on, on dot polygon right now. Uh, so, and, and I would say that he, that may be something that happens. And um, again, the, in, in some cases, uh, is that there's just issues around trademarks that have to be uh, worked out. And so, those are things that happen. And I know it's super boring to think about it, but if you're building for the long term, you want to make sure you're building on something that you know is inevitable and you don't want to accidentally step on somebody's toes. Nice. Inevitable. We come back to it again. <laughs> okay, so I think we have like three minutes. There are some community questions, but probably we can get them answered on Twitter itself, uh, coordinating with Nora. But we have a quick rapid fire. It's just uh, one line answers only needed from you. And there are four questions. So how many unstoppable domains do you own and how many Web2 domains do you still own? Mm. So I own at least 100 plus Web2 domains, right? Because they're supposed to be supporting for, uh, for all the different variations of unstoppable the company because we didn't want people to squat on us. And then I probably own like two dozen unstoppable you know, NFT domains. And and we don't we try not to speculate internally, and we do that on purpose because when we launched on Stoppable Domains, someone was like, "Oh, Matt just owns all the good domains, right?" <laughs> is what is is yeah. somebody accused me of that? And I'm like, "No, I really don't. Like, I just have like my name and then like my 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 uh, gaming handle and several other things like that." So I I own like two dozen domain names, and I intentionally do not speculate on our own because I think people would accuse me of cheating, right? So that's why we did it that way. Have you ever transferred? Um, money, uh, crypto to a wrong wallet address, and yes. how much was it? Yeah, it was about a thousand dollars, and this was before I started Unstoppable Domains, and it was a copy pasta error where I had a virus, right? That like you know I thought I had copied one, and then it actually had done another, uh, and that was actually one of the reasons why I thought domain names might be useful because then I wouldn't be copy pasting right these these addresses anymore. I would be typing it in. Very very hard for a hacker to trick that right because you can see where it's going. 
<laughs> okay, choose one Ethereum or Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It was first. I know it's terrible, but like Bitcoin was really the first to do it. So I think it has to be Bitcoin. Okay. And the last one, how much time do you spend on Zoom calls in a day? Probably four hours, right? It's way too many. Uh, but yeah, somewhere right around there. Uh, and I try to keep it less than that. More than that is, is I think, harmful. Okay. And then how much is it on a desk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The desk is, I live in my office. So, so yeah, I, I really, yeah, I mean, it's a, look, if you do a startup, it is a full-time job and it's a job that also requires weekend work, right? So you should just know that you're committed to doing that. Um, and yeah, you actually have to actively get up and move around too. So I think it's super important to get into a workout routine. Uh, so definitely do that if you're going to be starting a company too, because uh, you will, you will get the desk bod. If you uh, it, otherwise, because you will spend, be spending a lot of time behind the board. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. This was great talking to you. And thank you for spending this one hour with us to have this amazing conversation. And uh, all of you listening, if you enjoyed, please download this episode from Spotify. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Leave a comment. Leave some love. It helps us a lot in growing uh, the podcast audience. Thank you so much.